I'm John Bally. I'm from the University of Colorado in Boulder. I work primarily in the area of star and planet formation. And to be fair, I think we have to start by saying that we live in absolutely remarkable times. We are literally the first generation that has access to the entire spectrum. Uh, why is this? Well, first of all, because since the 60s, our electronic technologies have developed sensors which work from gamma rays to infrared to radio. And also since the 60s, we've had access to space, which has enabled us to get above the Earth's atmosphere and to see all these different wavelengths for the first time. And this has absolutely ushered in a revolution in our understanding of star and planet formation. And the reason for that is because when stars and planets form, they do so in environments which are very dark. Um, when we look into the sky with long time exposures, we realize that in addition to the stars, there's a rich interstellar medium of clouds and gas. And the densest parts of these interstellar clouds are completely opaque to starlight. Starlight is absorbed by these clouds and then reprocessed and re-emitted at much longer wavelengths, where, in fact, to see these wavelengths, we have to fly above the Earth's atmosphere. So in the last few decades, we have flown successfully a number of missions. Um, first in the infrared with the Infrared Astronomy Satellite 1984, and then uh, much more recently, the largest space telescope to be launched is called the Herschel Space Observatory. And Herschel was designed to map the interstellar gas and dust at wavelengths ranging from about 70 microns out to 500 microns. So that's something like 150 times the wavelength of visual light to several thousand times the wavelength of visual light. So th this has uttered in a revolution because for the first time, we can actually see what the gas and dust in the Milky Way, which is still actively participating in the active star and planet formation, actually looks like and what it's doing. So that's, that's been one of the big areas of research I've been involved with, is to use the Herschel Space Observatory to map the Milky Way um, to trace all the gas and dust that has the potential for forming future generations of stars and planetary systems. So let me tell you a little bit about our pro project. So the program I'm participating in is called the Herschel Galactic Plane Survey, or HIGAL. Uh, it's using 900 hours of the Herschel Space Observatory's um, telescope time. We've been operating for about three years now. Um, the PI is a, a, an Italian scientist by the name of Sergio Molinari. And in fact, our team has well over 150 scientific members. It just goes to show you that modern science is no longer done in the backyard with small telescopes. Uh, it involves huge collaborations and enormous amount of effort to acquire the data, to reduce the data, and to analyze the data. So Herschel has produced the first all-sky map, or so, let me rephrase that, the first map of the entire Milky Way covering 720 square degrees of the sky uh, in these far infrared and submillimeter wavelengths. And so it, we are using it to probe the conditions in which stars and planetary systems form. So as a little bit of background, one of the nearest sites of ongoing star and planet formation is located in the constellation of Orion in the winter sky. And if you know your constellations, uh, in this December or November, you go out um, right after sunset, you'll see Orion rising in the southeast. And in the central part of Orion, in a region we call the Sword of Orion, which is located just below the so-called belt stars, there is an object we call the Great Nebula in Orion. And this is one of the visually most spectacular regions in the sky. If you look there with a small telescope, you see this beautiful glowing cloud of greenish gas. What you're actually seeing there is the result of the birth of several massive stars from dense clouds in Orion, which have heated the gases and ionized their constituents, causing trace elements like oxygen and hydrogen to glow. And so the glow of that gas can be seen easily with a pair of binoculars or a small telescope. When we use our largest telescopes, we discover that the Orion Nebula has actually given birth to well over 2,000 stars in the last few million years. Among those stars, there are a half a dozen which are really luminous and massive, which are in fact causing the nebula to be lit up and ionized. And alongside those massive stars, there are hundreds of sun-like stars and many of these stars, we have found, are surrounded by the kind of environments which we think formed our planetary system, the solar system. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, which has taken the sharpest images ever obtained with the uh, uh, at optical wavelengths of Orion, has revealed that something like 20 or 30% of those stars are surrounded by disks, 
uh, disks which we think theoretically are the birthplaces of planetary systems. We've also learned that our own solar system probably formed in an Orion-like environment, in a rich environment with thousands of other stars. And at the same time that the low mass stars like the sun were assembling their planetary systems, massive stars in the environment were already dying. And as a result of that, they were injecting short-lived radioactive species into the young solar system, where in fact, um, we can see the remnants of those um, injections of short-lived radioactive species in primitive meteorites. So when we collect samples of materials from the solar system, specifically meteorites that have rained down on our planet, and we analyze their contents, we actually discover that in the early solar system, when the first minerals were condensing out of the disk which made the solar system, there were short-lived species like aluminum-26 and an isotope of iron called iron-60, which can only be formed by supernovae. As a result, we have concluded that the sun must have formed within less than a light year of a massive star that was in the process of dying exactly when the solar system was being assembled. So what kind of environment does that imply we formed in four and a half billion years ago? Almost certainly an environment similar to the Orion Nebula, where thousands of other stars are forming, along with a few massive ones, where, um, which are responsible for injecting some of the elements which are still heating the interior of our Earth today. So one of the other lessons we've learned from the Orion Nebula is that the harsh, ultraviolet-rich radiation field of these massive stars may actually trigger the first stages in the birth of planetary systems. The idea is that the ultraviolet light heats the surfaces of planetary disks, protoplanetary disks, causing the light gases like hydrogen and helium to evaporate. As a result of that, the denser materials, specifically dust particles and solids, ices, that have condensed from the parent molecular cloud, those objects tend to be sequestered and sink to the midplane of the, of the protoplanetary disk. The, as a result of this, the center of parts of protoplanetary disks tend to become enriched in heavy elements, solids, and ices, and tend to become gravitationally unstable more easily and condense by the force of gravity more, more directly than in the absence of these ultraviolet light. So not only do we get a fresh injection of elements from dying massive stars, we also get radiation fields which may actually promote the first stages in planet formation in regions like Orion. So the Orion Nebula has been a remarkable environment for us because it has told us many new things about the way our own solar system formed.